Welcome back to our study of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I'm Becky Pouliou. Today, our focus is on blessed are the merciful and also blessed are the pure in heart. So again, if you haven't seen the previous lessons, go back and watch them because they do build on one another. And let's now get out your Bibles, colored pencils, pen, paper, whatever you need, and let's get going. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are glorious, Lord. Thank you for working in each of our lives, teaching us, growing us in you, and giving us understanding. Father, in this world of chaos, we pray that you will teach us to be merciful to those who need mercy, including those who hate us. Teach us also what it means to be pure in heart. It doesn't seem possible to have pureness of heart because of all the evil that we're exposed to each day. But we do desire a pure heart, so we pray that you change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. And as always, let's say our memory verses together. Matthew 5, 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And Matthew 5, 3 through 6. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. To review, Jesus began his Sermon on the Mount with a section we called the Beatitudes, which is a character of those who are part of the kingdom of heaven. The common word is blessed, and that's who Jesus taught about, those who are blessed. The poor in spirit are blessed. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Those who mourn are blessed, and they'll be comforted. The gentle are blessed. They'll inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed. They'll be satisfied. The merciful are blessed. They'll receive mercy. And the pure in heart are blessed. They'll see God. Those who fit the description of each of these will enter the kingdom of heaven. In our last lesson, we focused on those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These are those who have seen their own spiritual poverty before God and have mourned over their sin. They hunger and thirst after the righteous life that can be lived out only when they submit or become gentle to the control of the Holy Spirit. Hunger and thirst represent the absolute needs one has for life. Without food and water, a person can't live. These are people who have that kind of hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God, not an outward show for the praise of men. It's the righteousness which surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees. Since our focus today is on Matthew 5, 7, we're going to look up the words merciful and mercy in that verse. And this is again, blueletterbible.org. We're going to type in Matthew 5, 7. And click on tools and scroll down. Oops, went too far. Whoops, <laughs> there it is. And yeah, we'll listen to it. Strong's G, 1655, Le Emon. Le Emon. I like that. Le Emon. Le Emon. <laughs> All right, so we click on the G, 1655, and scroll down. And it says merciful. Okay, that gives us nothing. <laughs> so, compassionate, actively merciful. Okay, well, let's, uh, before we move over to Bible Hub, let's look at mercy. Strong's G, 1653, L-A-L, L-A-L. Aha, and we go down. Ah, we've got a little bit more here on mercy, to have mercy on. <laughs> to help one afflicted or seeking aid. To help the afflicted, to bring help to the wretched. To experience mercy. And then it says, under def Strong's definitions, to compassionate. 
by word or deed, especially by divine grace. Have compassion, pity on, have, obtain, receive, shoe, mercy, or mercy on. Okay, well, let's just go over to Bible Hub and see what they have to say. Let's scroll down to Matthew. And we want Matthew 5, of course. And we want Matthew 5, 7. And then we're going to click interlinear. And click on, there it is right there, 1655. See what they have to say. Scroll down a bit. And it says, full of pity, merciful, compassionate. It says, acting consistently with the revelation of God's covenant. Now let's go back and check out the other one, 1653. And scroll down a little bit. Uh, to have pity on or mercy on, to show mercy, pity, have mercy on, um, under the helps word studies it says to show mercy as god defines it i.e as it accords with his truth or his covenant which expresses god's covenant loyalty mercy i.e acting on only on his terms so that gives us both merciful and mercy but can someone be merciful without having god himself dwelling within well, of course, people from every age have had compassion on others, even when they weren't saved. Pharaoh's daughter is a prime example. She had compassion on this Hebrew baby, Moses, who was supposed to be cast into the Nile to be killed. But instead, his mom placed him in a basket and Pharaoh's uh, daughter found him and had compassion on him and raised him as her own, even though she knew what her father's decree was. Uh, King Darius is another uh, prime example, he wanted to spare Daniel from the lion's den, but he couldn't go against his own decree, which he had made unwittingly. He said that everybody needed to worship him alone for a certain period of time, and Daniel was, to thine own self be true. He went up to the window and prayed as he always had. Wasn't going to change his ways, so of course Darius had to throw him into the lion's den. He didn't want to. He wanted to compare give him compassion, have mercy on him. So obviously, people from all walks of life, whether they're saved or not, they can have compassion if they so desire and extend mercy to others. Now highlight all the references to mercy in the following verses. Let's see what these verses say about where mercy can be found. Luke 6, 35 and 36, But love your enemies and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. 2 Corinthians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Ephesians 2, 4-7 But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So, God the Father of mercies is rich in mercy. Believers are called to be merciful like he is. Those who don't know God can do merciful acts, but it's the ones who have God dwelling within who can extend true mercy as their father does. Believers who have been forgiven by God can extend his mercy to those who have wronged them, even to their enemies. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus called Christians to love and pray for their enemies. Their debts are forgiven if they forgive their debtors. Continue marking everything that pertains to being merciful in these verses. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. 
Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you, if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Jesus said to forgive seventy times seven. That means unceasingly. God shows compassion and forgiveness on us, but if we don't show it on others and forgive them, then his righteous judgment will come upon us. We must forgive from the heart. Let's see what James 2.13 says about this. So we just saw that there's a relationship between mercy and forgiveness. Now we're going to look at mercy versus judgment. James 2.13 says, For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So those who show no mercy will receive a merciless judgment. It's the merciful who will receive mercy. And we see that in Matthew 5, 7. Colossians 3, 12 and 13 says, So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So our application questions are, is there anyone you need to show mercy to by totally forgiving them? If so, what are you going to do? How will it affect your relationship to that person? Take time to consider these questions and pray about them. So now we're going to do a word study on the word pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So we've gone to blueletterbible.org, and we're going to type in Matthew 5, 8. Hit enter, and there it is. Click on tools. That gives us the interlinear. Scroll down to the word pure. Listen to it. Strong's G, 2513. Katharas. Katharas. So it's Greek 2513, we click on, scroll down, and it says, clean, pure, physically, purified by fire, in a similitude, like a vine cleansed by pruning and so fitted to bear fruit. In a Levitical sense, clean, the use of which is not forbidden, imparts no uncleanness. Ethically, free from corrupt desire, from sin and guilt free from every admixture of what is false, sincere, genuine, blameless, innocent, unstained with the guilt of anything. And then scroll down a little bit farther and it says, of uncertain affinity, clean, literally or figuratively, clean, clear, pure. So let's look at uh, 
I like to do this Bible Hub and see what they say. Sometimes they have, whoops, I guess we've got to go further. A little better definition we are not going to mark. Let's go to Matthew and come back. Matt, oh, <laughs> it's being persnickety. Matthew 5 <laughs> and verse 8. Aha. <laughs> I think we finally got someplace. Interlinear. And here it is, 2513. It says clean. Click on it. See what else it says. It says clean, pure, unstained, either literally or ceremonially or spiritually. Guiltless, innocent, upright, uh, properly, without admixture, what is separated or purged, hence clean, pure, because unmixed, or without undesirable elements, and then figuratively, spiritually clean, because purged, purified by God, i.e. free from the contaminating, soiling influences of sin. So I really like what I'm <laughs> the Bible hub descriptions, but I do like to hear um, how it's described or how, how the word is said <laughs> over in Blue Letter Bible. But anyway, that gives us the description of pure. Okay, but we do need to look up the word C as well. So let's, we've gone back to blueletterbible.org and just because I like to listen to it. <laughs> Strong's G 3700. Optonomy, optonomy, Thayer's lexicon, oh. <laughs> optono, optono. Okay, surprised me. All right, so G37, Greek 3700. So we click on it and scroll down. Whoops, not too far. <laughs> and there, to look at, behold, to allow oneself to be seen, to appear. Okay, a middle voice, prolonged form of the primary middle voice, um, which is used for it in certain tenses in both. Of the, okay, I, yeah, they're talking about all these other numbers, all these other words that are related, and that's not what I want. So, <laughs> off we go to Bible Hub again. <laughs> and instead of messing with all that nonsense. Whoops, five, eight. Ha <laughs> ha, eight. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this a little faster. Click on interlinear, yay. <laughs> and we go over to the word C. And it says properly, to stare at, i.e. to discern clearly by extension to attend to by Hebraism. Hmm but uh, to experience passively to appear. And we'll click on it and see what it says. To see, perceive, attend to. See, look upon, experience, perceive, discern, beware. Properly see, often with metaphorical meaning, to see with the mind, ooh, <laughs> i.e. spiritually see, i.e. perceive with inward spiritual perception. I like that. Uh, let's see here, talking about the aorist form. Yeah, no, they're going, yeah, that's kind of what Blue Letter Bible was doing as well. But that gives us a good definition for the word C. So our verse is Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The word pure tells us that our hearts must be unstained with the guilt of anything, pruned and purified by fire. Now the blessing of this verse is that the pure in heart will see God. As believers know and follow God more and more, they see him or spiritually perceive him at a deeper level. And one day believers will see him face to face. Paul uses the same root verb of see twice in Romans 1.20 to explain one way that we see God. This is that spiritual perception. It says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, and you can see the same part of the word in there, 
being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So we can't physically see God, but we can mentally see or understand him when he reveals what he's doing in his word, his attributes, his sovereignty, his holiness, his omnipresence, for example, those are all invisible. Similarly, we don't see his physical hands holding our world together, but his word tells us that they are. Let's look at the relationship between Matthew 5, 21 through 48 and the pure in heart. Verses 21 through 47 of Matthew 5, which include don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't divorce, don't make false vows, give to him who asks, and love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, give illustrations of a righteousness from a pure heart, not just outwardly following the rules. Verse 48 says believers are to be perfect as their heavenly father is. That's 100% pure perfection. And they can be seen by the Father as such once they've accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and are forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness. As we read Psalm 15, 1-5 and Psalm 24, 1-6, make a list of what the citizens of heaven are like and what they receive. Psalm 15, 1-5 O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Psalm 24, 1 through 6. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Selah. So consider, if the first beatitude, poor in spirit, is what brings us into salvation so that the kingdom of heaven becomes ours, then aren't all the other beatitudes an outcome of our poverty of spirit? Having seen the magnitude of our failure, of our independent spirit, we can't help but mourn. Yet in that mourning, our Lord is there to comfort us. Having laid aside that independent prideful spirit, Realizing the grievousness of it all and confessing it to our Father, we can't help but submit in meekness or gentleness to our Lord Jesus. Thus, the earth, which we once tried to gain, instead will be inherited as a joint heir of Christ Jesus. Because we're now born of his Spirit, there's a hunger and thirst for righteousness. And as we crave him more and more, we find him to be the deepest satisfaction of our soul. Jesus satisfies. Now it's only natural that we become more and more like him. Therefore, mercy can't help but flow from our lives to others. And as it does, we experience his great mercy more and more and are overwhelmed by it. Being now caught up in him and no longer having a heart of stone but a heart of flesh, there comes the knowledge that our heart must be pure in order to see him more and more. Our hunger and thirst for righteousness has revealed this to us. The greater the purity of our heart, the more intimately we'll know him, for there will be less and less to dim our spiritual vision.
Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So if you're just now realizing that you want to be rid of your old sinful ways and you desire a peace in your life that surpasses all understanding, cry out to Jesus. Ask him to forgive your sins and to make you pure before God, a new creature in Christ. And then find a church which teaches God's truth directly from his holy word, the Bible. And pray that Christ will guide you in this. Our new memory verses today are Matthew 5, 7, and 8. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Father of all glories, we thank you for what you are doing in our lives, changing us and molding us into who you want us to be. We praise you for giving us the desire to study your word in depth, inductively, precept upon precept. Help us to grow in you each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Another good study. Next time, our focus will be on the peacemakers and those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Hope you'll join me again.